Okay, let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Chapter 12, the last chapter, chapter 12. Apologist Ravi Zacharias posits that there are, that in an adequate worldview, an adequate worldview seeks to answer the four ultimate questions. The question, the question of origin, the question of meaning, the question of morality, the question of destiny. In other words, origin, where did I come from? Meaning, why am I here? Morality, what is right, what is wrong? Destiny, where am I going? Um, an adequate worldview seeks to answer those four questions. Uh, and to do that in a thoughtful, rational way, uh, then you have to have two things. You have, to have, uh, you have to have correspondence and you have to have coherence. Um, in other words, you have to have, uh, it has to correspond to physical evidence. In other words, to answer those questions, is, is there evidence that supports the answer to those four ultimate questions? And then secondly, do those answers cohere? Do they fit together? In other words, uh, does the answer to each one of those questions answer itself in a way that doesn't compromise the other three? So the writer of Ecclesiastes, which we believe is Solomon, he is addressing some of the ultimate questions. and He's addressing, I think, particularly the, the question about meaning. What is the meaning of life? What is, there, what is the purpose to our existence? Why am I here? Uh, what is the purpose of life under the sun? You find that phrase repeated over and over again in the book of Ecclesiastes. So the question is, how, do we, how can we as Christians live a life that transcends the meaninglessness of this world and the secular worldview that's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, that's the question the writer of Hebrews is seeking to answer. Uh, and could there be a more appropriate question for our time as a society as we continue to make our slide into the secular? So let's look at this, chapter 12, Ecclesiastes. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon, and the stars are darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, and the strong men are bent, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the windows are dim, and the doors on the street are shut, when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the, the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or bad evil. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, apart from you, life is meaningless. There is no real, coherent, satisfying 
worldview that brings peace outside the worldview that's based upon your truth. And so, Father, I, I pray that as we, we talk about these things and look at this chapter, I think uh, particularly of our younger generation. And I pray that by your spirit, you would uh, raise up an army of youth dedicated to the cause of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who um, are getting older, may we, uh, in our, even in our final years, continue to be fruitful and to be a blessing. I pray, Father, that if there's someone here today that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that the Spirit of God would reveal their need of him today and that they might repent and trust him. We pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. All right, Solomon has, uh, through the book of Ecclesiastes, he's been building to a great climax. And here in the final chapter, we find the bottom line, the conclusion of the whole matter. Um, in chapter 11, it is kind of interesting. Um, in verse 9 of chapter 11, he challenges young people to enjoy the gift of life. <laughs> to enjoy life. God wants... You know, this is something that I think is a misconception many people have, that God doesn't want us to have no fun. Well, that's not true. God wants us to live life. Uh, he, Jesus said, I came that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. And so um, he challenges young people to enjoy life and also to remember that as we enjoy life, to remember that we are accountable to the God who gives us life. The giver of life. He reminds this younger generation that the way to really enjoy this incredible gift of life is to play by the rules, by the creator's rules. Now, whenever you read a, a book of the Bible, um, you should always be looking for Jesus and how he is revealed. Um, actually, Jesus is revealed in the book of Ecclesiastes as the wisdom of God. Um, he is the preacher who pronounces wisdom from him flow the wisdom of God. Uh, but primarily, when you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, Jesus is kind of in the shadows here. And he gradually enters, and he is revealed as the sovereign God, the ruler of the universe, who controls all things. You know, By him, the Bible says, all things are held together. And uh, he is the one that works all things together for good. Uh, to everything, he has a purpose and a time for everything under heaven. We learned that in chapter 3. So as we continue to plod through the book of Ecclesiastes, eventually the lights are turned on a little bit more, and we find he's not only the sovereign God, he is the inscrutable God. He is beyond us. He transcends us. He is the God who is beyond our comprehension. He is the mysterious master of everything that takes place under the sun. Um... His ways are higher than our ways, uh, as I read at the beginning of the service. Who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may, might be his counselor? You know, and then finally, he is um, center stage as the great creator. He's the sovereign God. He's the inscrutable God. He is also our creator God, the one to whom we own our existence. Um, by the way, that does answer the question of origin, does it not? Where did I come from? God created mankind. God created us. God created everything that is. Um, you know, we exist because we were created by God in his image for his glory. Uh, the Apostle John said it this way in Revelation chapter 4. Here's what he said. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So now the curtain is about the fall on the book of Ecclesiastes and uh, the teacher, he calls himself the preacher here. Um, the word actually could mean either preacher or a teacher. Uh, the wise man, he's about to put down his pen. But before he does that, he leaves us with the answer to that ultimate question, why am I here? Uh, how do we make sense of all that goes on under the sun? What is the purpose of life? We see that in verse 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God, keep his commandments. 
this is the whole duty of man. So um, what is the purpose of life? What is the bottom line? We must come to revere and obey and submit ourselves to this sovereign, infinite, inscrutable creator God. We are to keep his commandments. And um, so he develops that in this chapter by challenging us to consider three things. Three things we need to consider. The first thing we need to consider is the duration of our lives. That is, I am growing old, okay? We are getting older, the duration. So consider, first of all, I want you to think about it this way. Solomon is asking me to consider the duration of my life, that I'm getting older. You say, well, I'm a young person. I'm not thinking about getting older. Well, you should. Um, you know, remember your creator, the one who made you, fashioned you intricately in your mother's womb, uh, designed you according to his purpose for your life. Everything about you has a purpose God intended. Um, and the one who knows you best is the one who knows how life should be lived. I was in um, Germany uh, many years ago, and we were giving some gospel tracts out. There was a group of young people in the square, and uh, we decided, well, we'd give out some uh, gospel tracts. Uh, had gospel, little pamphlets with the gospel. And as soon as this group of young people we gave these tracts to, as soon as they realized what they were, many of them proceeded to wad them up and throw them in the garbage. And one of them said something to the missionary that he had, he later translated to me. I said, well, what, what's, what did he say? And he said something about um, five years, you know, in other words, um, I don't want to even think about God for at least another five years. And this kid must have been like in either late teens, early 20s. And he said, so I have at least five years before I even need to think about God. Um, which I think is a great tragedy. You know, that was over 30 years ago. And uh, I can't help but wonder if that young man ever thinks about God now. Because uh, statistics indicate in surveys that 85% of those who identify as Christians became Christians before their 20th birthday. 85%. That's why Solomon, the wise man, says... Remember your creator in the days of your youth. You know, because you don't want to risk forgetting the one who not only gives meaning and purpose to your life, but also the one who can forgive you and cleanse your heart from sin. Don't, don't think because you're young you can put off thinking about spiritual things. That would be a great tragedy. Procrastination in terms of your relationship to God is a very, very dangerous game. It's like playing spiritual Russian roulette with your soul. You're gambling with your ever-living uh, soul. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Remember, now your creator in the days of your youth Solomon said in Proverbs 27, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, because you do not know what a day may bring forth. You have no guarantee that you'll wake up tomorrow morning. You know, James says, What is your life? It is like a vapor that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. I mean, the fact of the matter is, we're all getting older. <laughs> you know, there are, are three things that mark the beginning of old age. And the first one is memory loss. And for the life of me, I can't remember the other two. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, sometimes I look in the mirror and think, holy cow, <laughs> when did this happen? <laughs> so, um, you know, how do you know when you're getting older? Well, I, I came across this. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, you, you know you're getting older when everything hurts and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. <laughs> um, you know you're getting older when you feel like the night before and you haven't been anywhere. <laughs> or you sit in a rocking chair and you can't get it going. You know you're getting old when your knees buckle and your belt won't. 
Uh, you know, you're getting older when dialing long distance wears you out. Your fortune teller offers to read your face. A fortune teller offers to read your face. That's not even funny. Uh, this is, this is kind of cute. You know you're getting older when the little gray-haired lady you help across the street is your wife. <laughs> you wake up in the morning and your water bed has sprung a leak. And you realize you don't have a water bed. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have said that anyway. When, th th these are getting a little, uh, well, anyway. I'll go ahead and finish. Might as well. I'm in deep now. Might as well finish. <laughs> When you watch a pretty girl go by and your pacemaker makes the garage door go up. <laughs> this is really the most pertinent one, that you know you're getting old when you know all the answer, but nobody asks the question. <laughs> and when you decide to procrastinate, but you never get around to it. So, you know, this is an interesting thing. He's saying, he begins the chapter by saying, remember. So, let's just understand when he says remember he's not just specifically referring to mental recall he's he's talking about more than just um, mental activity it has the idea of committing your life to something of faithfulness to God look at what the psalmist in Psalm 137 I'll read this from the New Living Translation and it has to do with about remembering God and what it means to remember God. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill upon the heart. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I fail to remember you. If I don't make Jerusalem my highest joy. You know, God wants us to remember Him. You know, um, has anyone ever forgotten your birthday or anniversary or something? You know, as a spouse, did your spouse forget your anniversary or your birthday? You know, some, you know does, how does that make you feel when you're left out or forgotten? You know, I think we need to consider how God feels. wonder if God ever looks down on us and says, hey, remember me? You know, we get so caught up in our little lives, don't we? Remember your creator in the days of your youth. That's why, by the way, that's why God instituted the feast for the nation of Israel. Um, there were, of course, there's theological implications in the Jewish festivals, but they were primarily a tool for the people to remember what God had given, done for them and given to them. You know? <laughs> By the way, when we were in Israel, our guide, Sfi, said, you know, you can sum up the Israeli festivals in three statements. You tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. <laughs> so, um, but they were intended, and, so, and for us as Christians, Jesus has given us the Lord's Supper, the Memorial Supper, because it's important to remember what God has done for us. And so look what he does here. In verses um, 2 and 3, um, he depicts the duration of life uh, in terms of the course of the sun and the stars in their courses. Um, the reference to clouds, he speaks about the early and latter rains that come each year, particularly in the land of Israel. We were just there in the dry season. Um, but there is a rainy season, and the, the whole point is that the seasonal changes of the year are also a reminder to us about the seasons of life. Some of you here today, um, you know, you're in the spring of your life. That's great. Um, some of you are in the summer. Maybe some of us are in the fall or even the winter part of our life. Spring and summer eventually must give way to the fall and winter. The rainy season is followed by the dry season. But the thing about it is the cycle is sure to repeat itself. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Particularly, you know this is true when you've lost someone who's very close to you and somebody that you love and, and you lose them in death. It, it always amazes me how relentlessly life goes on. You know, you, you could die tomorrow. I could die tomorrow. But you know what? Life goes on. The seasons keep playing themselves out. But the one thing we have in common right now is that we are all getting older. And we need to consider. So what do you want to accomplish with your life? What are you doing with your life? Are you spending it on yourself? Are you investing it in the cause of Christ? 
You know, um, have you started yet? You know, because here's the thing. There's going to come a time, as he talks about here, when your motivation dies. Oh, that's a horrible thing. When some of your dreams die and you, ra- you realize that it's never going to happen. That's what he says here. Uh, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. When you say, I don't have any pleasure in them. Your dreams die. Your hopes grow dim. Listen, the only way, and I, I hope you get this point because um, it's very, very important. The only way to guarantee that you are in going going to enjoy your last years and the winter of your life is to invest your time now for Jesus. So that you can say, listen to this with the psalmist. This is from Psalm 92. Uh, I think, I don't know if we got it on the screen or not, but here's what, so that you can say when it comes down to the last years of your life, but the godly will flourish like palm trees And grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. For they are transplanted into the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Even in old age. They will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. They will declare the Lord is just. He is my rock. There is nothing but goodness in him. Boy I tell you what. I want to finish my days like that. So remember now, consider the duration of your life. While you have the light in the spring of your life, in the summer of your life, remember your creator. Live daily in his presence. Follow his will because your sun eventually is going to set. Winter is coming. Live for Jesus now so that the sunset years of your life will be productive for God. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. You know, he, he deserves our best years. You know, I, I, you know, God's never impressed with le- leftovers. I mean, how utterly selfish could it be? So I'm going to live my life now, and then when I'm old, you know, then I'll start going to church and be faithful and serve, doing all this. What? A, no, 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 no. Remember him in the days of your youth because you never know what tomorrow may bring. It's the only way to ensure you will enjoy your old age. So consider the duration of your life. You're getting older. Secondly, he wants you to consider the deterioration of your body. The deterioration of my body, I am breaking down. So he takes us from the duration of life to the the deterioration of the body. And what he does here, with a series of metaphors, he makes an analogy. Kind of like an allegory, I should say. And uh, we have here one of the great allegories in all the Bible. I think this is, this is an amazing allegory here because Solomon compares the human body to a house. That's what he's doing here uh, in verses 3, 4, and 5. Uh, he, he's talking about our body breaking down as we get older. Okay? So I want you to look at this. This is, you know, comparing the human body to a house is entirely fitting for us, isn't it? Particularly if you're a homeowner, you know this is true. Because when you buy a house, you buy a job. Because things wear out, they break down, or as you say here in Maryland, go up. I don't know what that means. So um, Paul uses the same analogy, does he not? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says this. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So let let me let me explain something to you that it's it's simple. You already know this, but by way of reinforcing this truth, let me say this: You are not a body. You have a body. You live in a body. Um, That that body that you're inhabiting right now is the temporary dwelling place. That you're inhabiting while you're here on earth. And guess what? Your house is breaking down. (laughs) Now this is not to say that everybody's going to experience these uh, metaphors in the same way or to the same degree. That's not what he's saying. Um, You know, 
But these things he says here are the marks of old age. So let me go through them. If you have your Bibles, I hope you have your Bibles. Let's go through these real quickly. Uh, when he says in verse 3, in the day when the keepers of the house, that is a reference to the hands. He says the hands begin to tremble. They begin to shake. I think, you know, um, what was it the other day? I, was, I had to get wifey to help me with a button. What is with this retarded button? You know, I couldn't just, you know, you start getting arthritis, you know, and, and some people get, they begin to shake. The keepers begin of the house begin to tremble. The strong men are, are bent. The legs weaken. You know, I, this, this hit me pretty strong because my dad, who was one of the hardest working men I've ever known in my life, um, he just couldn't get around like he used to. I said, and I said, Paul, you know, I said, what's wrong with your legs? <laughs> you know, and see, he was kind of stubborn. You know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do, he wouldn't go to the doctor. You know, I said, Dad, what's wrong with your legs? They're wore out. That's all he would say. <laughs> They're just wore out. And you know, he's getting around in that walker, and his legs were. It, it was, you know, the strong man. It says are bent. I certainly saw that. In my father. The grinders, well, you can imagine what it was like in the days before dental hygiene, can you not? Uh, the days before, um, you know, false teeth. Well, you know, I heard about a couple, by the way. They were married for 50 years. And uh, he was sitting in his chair reading the paper, and she was sitting there watching television. And she said, Well, things have really changed here, haven't they? He said, Well, what do you mean? She said, Well, you know, you used to sit really close to me. So he got his paper, he went over, and he sat down next to her. He says, how's this? She said, yeah, well, you used to put your arm around me. So he put his arm around her, gave her a little squeeze. He said, how's that? Yeah, well, she said, well, you know, you used to, you know, kind of kiss me on the neck and nibble on my earlobe. And when he said that, she said that, he just jumped up and started walking out of the room. She said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness uh, Solomon says here those that look through the windows of course that's a reference to failing eyesight you know failing eyesight uh, back then they couldn't just walk down to go, go to town and check, check out the lens crafters they couldn't do that you know think about that they, couldn't, they had no cataract surgery back then Verse 4 talks about hearing loss. Sounds uh, that one <coughs> hears are muffled as they're, they're coming from behind closed doors. Do you know what he said there? When the doors on the street are shut. And when, you know, when, when you hear things and you, know, you just don't hear as well as you used to. One rises up at the sound of a bird may refer to difficulty in sleeping. Uh, the daughters of music uh, refer to the voice changing. People in, in um, old age tend to mumble and they have lost the strength of voice they once had. And then you get down to verse 5. Old age brings new fears into a person's life. They fear falling because of the damage when you're, you get older. And, you know, older folks are afraid of falling because it takes so much to, to heal and to fix yourself. You don't heal as quickly as you used to. And, um, you know, you... Terror is in the way means the, the road loses its appeal. Traveling becomes more of a hassle. It mentions the al almond tree, which in Israel, very interesting that Solomon uses the almond tree blossoming here because in Israel, um, it would, uh, in midwinter, it would bloom with no leaves. It would bloom with no leaves, and all it would have is just white blossoms all over it. So this, what he's doing here is he's picturing the hair going gray or the hair turning white. And the grasshopper, there's various interpretations for the grasshopper. Uh, D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, said he didn't know what that meant until on his deathbed where he just lingered through the night on his deathbed and hearing the grasshopper became a burden. That's, you know, when it says um, the grasshopper drags itself along, I think the King James Version said the grasshopper becomes a burden because you're just waiting for the night to end. Uh, desire... Um, Fails, literally, the word, uh, when it says desire fails there, it's the word that refers to the capperberry plant, which was an aphrodisiac. 
and it was synonymous with the sexual desire. Uh, in old age, the sexual drive diminishes. So, uh, what do we do today? You know, what do we do? Oh, we, we, isn't it amazing when you think about it? Um, we could talk about this the rest of the day. How America is consumed with, with uh, fighting old age and staying young. You know, uh, so we have eyeglasses, hearing aids, false teeth, wigs, hair coloring and other technologies to deal with the effects of aging, knee replacement, hip replacement, and yes, we should be grateful for these things. Um, you know, I didn't say anything, well, no, I don't, you know, people have cosmetic surgery. I, look, we're getting older, it's inevitable. Um, this old house in which we live is breaking down. So what is, in light of that, what should we do? Give of your best to Jesus now. Give Jesus the strength of your life. Don't wait until you can't do something and you're worn out to say, okay, now I'll do something for Jesus. Consider the duration of your life, which is a vapor that appears for a little time, and the fact that you're not going to be able to do one day the things you can do now. We're growing old. We're breaking down. You know, I love that song that says, Give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Throw your soul's fresh growing ardor into the battle for truth. Consider the duration of your life, the deterioration of your body, and then the destination of your spirit, your soul. I'm going home. So I consider the duration of my life, it's short. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I consider that my body's wearing out. I should do what I can for Jesus now with all the strength that I have. And I should also consider the destination of my soul. I'm going home. Um, that's what he says here at the end of verse 5. Because man is going to his eternal home. So now, do you see what he's doing? The allegory changes from to picture the process of dying. Now notice what he does here. He's going to his eternal home. Verse 5, it says in the last part of that, and the mourners go about the street. So what is he doing? He's talking about death now. So the process of death, he's, he's, it's like this. If our body is likened to a house, then our life is compared to a journey. And he says here, let's look what he talks about dying. Because one day the journey is going to end. Uh, and I think, listen, to live in denial of that which is inevitable is foolish. It's fo utter folly. I mean, you know, it's, it's like the guy who jumps off the Empire State Building and was heard to cry as he passed the 50th floor. So far, so good. Yeah, well, guess what? The trip's going to end quickly. And so what does he say here? Look at some of these other um, al uh, metaphors he uses. He talks about uh, the spinal cord, the, verse 6. Before the silver cord is snapped. You know, how he pictures how death could possibly happen. We could break our neck, break our back, lose our function, become paralyzed, uh, the silver cord. Um, then he talks about, uh, of course, some people think that the silver cord being snapped is where the spirit separates from the body at death. You know, James says this, and even as the body without the spirit is dead in James chapter 2, you know, so talking about the silver cord being snapped is when the soul leaves the body. I don't know, but it's, it's a metaphor, and he's picturing death. He talks about the golden bro bowl being broken, of course. This um, is referring to uh, the cranium and the possibilities of brain functions being stopped by a stroke or something. He talks about the pitcher shattered at the fountain, about the heart is like um, the, the fountain that pumps blood to our bodies, and the pitcher stops. Or the wheel broken at the well or the cistern here speaks to the kidneys shutting down in renal failure, bringing eventual death. 
And he says, in light of this, he says, vanity in verse 8, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. That is living. What is vanity? What is vanity here is living without acknowledging that there's more to this life than living and dying and trying to make it through the day. As that song says it so, Stephen Curtis Chapman, there's more to this life, living and dying and trying to make it through the day. Living without any regard for God, living for your own selfish interests. According to the wise man, this is vanity. It's utter folly. All right, so let's wrap this up. You know, there are liberals who say that the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, they use the book of Ecclesiastes in their own twisted way to cast doubts on eternity. They say that the writer of, of Ecclesiastes here is really espousing a hedonistic lifestyle. The philosophy is, hey, yes, we're all going to die, so live it up while you can. Is that really what this book is saying? No, it's not. That's not what it's saying. It's not endorsing a philosophy that says get all you can, can all you get. The one with the most toys, uh, when he, the one who dies with the most toys wins. This is utter lunacy. That's not what this book is about. And this last section is basically the preacher saying, he basically is saying here, okay, I've said all of that to say this. And he gets to the bottom line. This is what life is all about. This is what I want to leave you with. So don't miss the point. And then look what he says here in verse 9. Uh, he gives a personal testimony about his own experience and how he taught. He says, besides being wise, the preacher taught the people. Knowledge. W okay. Look, uh, teachers, by the way, this is a small point, but let's make the point. Teachers always teach people. You don't teach science. You teach people science. You don't teach history, you teach people history. I know what you meant when we say we teach a certain subject, but what we're really teaching is people. So he's emphasizing that. He wants to use his life, investing his life in others. He taught the people. All right? So, um, you know, it's important that, because the goal of teaching is what? You know, you know, what I'm trying to do today, by the grace of God, is not just to impart knowledge, but to challenge you to change your life based upon the knowledge that you're hearing. To change people through imparting knowledge. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So, I'm not up here just wasting my time and your time just giving you some theological facts. I'm up here for the express purpose of lives being changed by the grace of God. You know, uh, in verses 9 and 10, we three, there, he gives them, there are three characteristics of, of the preacher here, which we also see these three same characteristics in the life of Jesus. First of all, look at the passion. The preacher's passion. He said he pondered and saw, sought out. In other words, he wasn't careless in his preparation. He took this seriously. He studied. You know, this is something that when I get to heaven, I've, got, I've really got to check this out because it's something that my little pea brain can't figure out. When it says in Luke 2.52 that Jesus increased in knowledge. Jesus increased in knowledge. In other words... In his humanity, he had to learn things. And Jesus, he was passionate about that. So much so that in Mark chapter 6, what were the people saying about him when he came to his hometown and started teaching the people? They said, where does this guy have this wisdom? It says, they marveled at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. It said that he taught as one having authority and not like the scribes. He was passionate about what he taught. Not only the preacher's passion, but his process. He sought to communicate effectively. Look what he says here. He sought to find the right words, verse 10. And uprightly he wrote words of truth. He says that he weighed and studied and arranged Proverbs with great care. 
so he sought to communicate effectively. He organized his material purposely. He wanted to use the right words to say the right thing in the right way. You know, uh, he thought about not just what he would say, but how he would say it. You know, I, I think about this when I think about Jesus, that look at how he taught. He used his surroundings to communicate spiritual truth. He used parables. He taught in a way nobody had ever heard before. They were astounded at his, at his words. When they went to arrest him and the centurion came back and they said, well, why didn't you bring him? And what did the, the guy say? He says, nobody ever spoke like this guy. They were amazed at his teaching. The Bible says this, one of the things I love about Jesus, it says about Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, the common people heard him gladly. When Jesus spoke, the people listened. His process and then his purpose. What was his purpose? To communicate truths. In verse 10, the last part, he uprightly, he wrote the words of truth. And then notice what he says in verse 11. The words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. I would say that to the younger generation. Beyond, beware of anything that goes beyond this right here. To communicate the words. You know, in our day and time, of course, it's not politically correct to say something is absolutely true for everybody. That's very audacious to assume that you have a corner on truth. I don't have a corner on truth. God does. I'm talking about the one who said, I am the truth. And yet, they're saying, people say, today, well, that might be true for you. But your truth is your truth. And my truth might be something else. You know what that is? That's ludicrous. That's, that's, that's stupidity. Truth is truth. An incredible statement. Jesus said, I am the truth. To make that kind of statement, when you, when, if, for Jesus to stand there and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He has to either be a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. And based upon his resurrection and his works, his mighty works, uh, he must be Lord. And so, uh, in closing, he illustrates the power of truth in two ways. He says, truth is, he says it's like goads. Now, I want you to follow this. As I, I'm wrapping this up, but I don't want you to miss, miss this. What is a goad? He says, the words of the wise are like goads. Truth is that which pushes us, goads us into action. If you really believe something is true, you will act upon it. You demonstrate, it's another way, way of saying this. You demonstrate what you believe, not by what you say, but by what you're goaded to do. What you're pushed, at, you're pushed to action to do. Your actions display what you really believe. When you believe the truth, it goads you. It prods you to behave in a certain way. Uh, when you believe the truth, it takes you out of your comfort zone. It motivates you to act on the basis of what is true. Then he says it's like nails. Now, what are nails? Nails are used to secure things in place. Paul exhorts us to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is never in vain. You know, it's truth that gives stability to our life. You know, somebody says, well... How can you be so sure about what you believe? Like, some, how do you know it's all so nailed down in a shut case? Well, I just believe it. God has given me the faith to believe Him, to trust Him. Nailed it down. I think, you know, hey, if uh, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, um, as far as truth is concerned, then you've pretty much got it nailed down, it's fixed. Christians don't go around biting their fingernails, worrying about, oh, is this, I wonder, I hope I'm right. Not like that. So let's get to the bottom line. And by the way, you know, he talks about books. There's always going to be books out there that are detrimental to faith, books that are anti-God, books that propagate, propagate lies and falsehood. So he says, let's just get to the bottom line. What's the bottom line? Fear God and keep his commandments. Boom. Microphone drop. <laughs> Fear God, keep his commandments. 
Now I want you to notice one thing before I close. Look at this verse, verse 13. It says, for this is the whole duty of man. However, however, the word duty is not in the Hebrew text. You know what he, Solomon is saying? For this is the whole of man. Not the whole duty of man. He's, he's basically saying this is what brings wholeness. This is what brings fulfillment. This is what brings peace and joy. To fear God and keep his commandments. Because if you fear God, you don't have to fear anything else. One day you're going to stand before God and the only thing that will matter is whether or not you gave your heart to him. That's why I love that song we sing here. When it's all been said and done, there is just one thing that matters. Did I live my life for truth? Augustine said it well. Lord, you've made us for yourself and our souls are restless until they find rest in you, O oh God. Now, in closing, I know I've, I, I love to close. I close five or six times. In the, in the, <laughs> just, I love to close. But now I'm really closing and I want to leave you with a poem. And um, this, this is a poem that just really grabbed me. And I hope you'll listen to it very carefully. Because it's by George Herbert and I don't even know who he is. But he wrote this poem, and I think it's amazing. So listen to what he said. When God at first made man, having a glass of blessing standing by, let us, said he, pour on him all we can. Let the world's riches, which dispersed lie, contracted into a span. So strength first made a way, then beauty flowed. Then wisdom, honor, pleasure. When almost all was out, God made a stay, perceiving that alone of all his treasure, rest in the bottom lay. For if I should, said he, bestow this jewel also on my creature, he would adore my gifts instead of me. And rest in nature, not the God of nature, so both should losers be. Yet let him keep the rest, but keep them with repining restlessness. Let him be rich and weary, that at least if goodness lead him not, yet weariness may toss him to my breast. Wow. What a God we have. And I say it not just to the younger generation, but to all of us today. Consider the duration of life it goes by so quickly. The deterioration of the body. Use what you strength you have to serve Jesus and consider where we're headed. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, what an incredible thing to realize and to understand that great truth that this world is not all there is. That there is a creator, that you are that creator, and to you, oh God, we will all one day give an account that this temporary brief existence here is a, a training ground. It is a testing ground. It is an opportunity to use the time and strength and opportunities that we have to live for you and to bring glory to you, to fear you and keep your commandments. Lord, I pray today, my, and you know, thinking about this sermon today, Lord, I, I cannot help but think about the younger generation and my heart breaks and while I am so grateful for young men and women who love Jesus yet I think about a younger generation that is increasingly turning away from you O oh Lord O oh God may we all leave this place today as missionaries to take the light of the gospel to a lost and dying world to remind them that this life is not all there is. And before I close my prayer, 
Dear friend, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, perhaps the Holy Spirit has put it in your heart right now that you have that desire to do that, to know Jesus. And so I would encourage you right here and now in the privacy of your own heart to invite Christ into your life, to trust Him. If you believe that He died on that cross for your sins, that He was buried and rose again, if you believe that, uh, He was the sacrifice for your sins, and that if you open your heart to Him, He will forgive you and cleanse you from sin, then I would ask you right now to call upon Him in your heart. Pray and ask Him to save you. Ask Him to forgive you. Turn your life over to Him. Commit your life to Jesus Christ. And follow him. And if you're making that decision, would you please let us know? Let us rejoice with you. People that make that kind of decision usually are very eager to share it with someone. I'm thinking about a day about a good friend of mine who's in heaven now. He's with the Lord now. But I remember the day after service, he came to me. He said, I want you to know I prayed to receive Christ today. You can do that too. I hope you will. Father, we thank you for Jesus, our blessed Savior. And thank you, Father, that we can know you. Thank you that you've not only made a way for us to be forgiven, for us to have a relationship with you, but you've also afforded us the great joy of serving you and investing our life in something greater than this life. So, Lord, help us today to be good stewards of the life you've given. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless. Go be the church.